Well, it's just after 930, so uh, I think we might want to go ahead and get started. Uh, I will give a, a short introduction again to Dr. Carey and then uh, let him begin speaking. Uh, I remind you that the way we're doing Q&A, and there will be a time for questions and answers, uh, is that as you think of your question, you can type it in the chat box, uh, and Dr. Carey will either read it himself or, or I will uh, read it to him so that he can answer it during the Q&A. But uh, we encourage you to wait and don't necessarily type the question in right at the beginning of his talk, because it may well be that as he goes through his talk, he'll answer the question that you had. So uh, do hold out towards the end, until towards the end of his talk to start typing in your questions. And after his talk, which uh, will end uh, around 10.30, 10.35, or the Q&A will end at the <laughs> that time, uh, at 10.40 we'll have uh, our mid-morning prayer led by uh, Monsignor Joe Lehman. Well, welcome to the second day of the 2020 Larkham Conference. I'm the Reverend Nicholas Forti, and I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter to you once again. Dr. Philip Carey is a professor of philosophy at Eastern University, a renowned Augustan scholar, an author of academic essays and books, as well as articles and books for a broader Christian readership and an instructor for the teaching company's great courses. Indeed, it was listening to Dr. Carey's teaching company course on Martin Luther that led me personally from reading the great reformer as only a theologian of the church's past to hearing Luther as a living theological voice for the church today. And in part, that's what Dr. Carey is teaching all of us to do in these three talks on being formed by the gospel in a post-Christian age. Yet, Dr. Carey writes in the introduction to his book, The Meaning of Protestant Theology, he's not urging everyone to become Lutheran or even to become Protestant. He goes on to write that he believes, quote, the church, the one body of Christ, needs Catholics and Orthodox, as well as Protestants of various kinds, and that when the day comes when we properly understand the oneness of the church, we will be able to honor our differences without creating division between ourselves, end quote. This is because the oneness of the church will ultimately be found to be grounded in the centrality of the gospel and its power to give us Christ. And it is this very gospel that we have the pleasure of hearing more about from Dr. Philip Carey this morning. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. And I, once again, um, you're saying such nice things about me. Um, I just got a note here. Okay, great. Uh, all right, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it's all about the gospel, which is, is to say it's all about Christ. And that's going to be where the unity of the church comes from. Um, I still remember how so many of my own theological quandaries were sorted out when George Lindbeck, um, a great ecumenist whom many of you know, uh, and my teacher said, well, you know, all of these ecumenical things start to become clearer when we realize that the church is about Christ and that our faith is about Christ and that we're about Christ. And when, when you get the centrality of Christ, other things fall into place. So thinking about the gospel is a way of thinking about the centrality of Christ. Um, and we can start there, but I also was thinking, haha, um, it might be nice to answer some of the questions that were asked last night and didn't get answered. I'll try to be quick about it, but I think this will serve as a good review and a good introduction to what we're doing. So um, um, for those of you who were last night, I'll, I'll, I, for those of you who weren't, I'll try not to be spending too much time on this. Um, one question was about sort of Augustinian terror. Mm -hmm. the, there's this journey uh, uh, to God, which is the, the, the overarching metaphor for, for Augustine's uh, spirituality, um, can cr create a certain kind of terror because you're, you're not home yet, you're not perfect yet, and your imperfection can be a source of terror, especially 
uh, late in the Middle Ages in the 15th and 16th century. Luther was an inheritor of that terror. What about other non-Augustinian schools was the question. And it turns out that although there was a kind of Augustinian school in theology, there's a certain kind of Augustinian character to all of Western theology for about a thousand years or more after Augustine's death. Western theology is largely Augustinian theology, even among people who are not part of an Augustinian school. So you don't think of Thomas Aquinas as an Augustinian, and yet there's a vast amount of Augustine's thought in Thomas Aquinas. Um, so it, it, there's a whole lot of, of the Augustinian kind of journey motif that just it's a common uh, territory, uh, the common view of the West. Um, so, so, you know, Luther and Calvin and Aquinas and, and Peter Lombard and Duns Scotus, all of them are inheritors of Augustine because you could say Augustine is the, the common father of the West. Um, this is related then to a second question about performance anxiety, which, which I highlighted last time. Um, the terror that medieval Christians were feeling, especially in the late Middle Ages around Luther's time, um, may not be a terror that all of us share. But behind it is a certain kind of very common anxiety, a kind of performance anxiety. Am I doing well enough? Um, and of course, if you're not doing well enough and that means you go to hell, then the performance anxiety can be absolute terror. Um, the question was whether this kind of performance anxiety was a universal human problem. I'm thinking that it was a very distinctive problem. I mean, we can all have performance anxiety whenever we're performing. But there's a very distinctive kind of performance anxiety late in the Middle Ages because I think primarily of uh, a new intensification of introspection that happened because of the growth of um, really of the sacrament of penance. Um, penance had been something that was done rarely actually in Augustine's time. It was for notorious sinners who were separated from the church and had to, had to do penance in order to be received back into the church and, and no longer be excommunicated. But by Luther's time, penance was a regular part of Christian spirituality, especially in the monasteries, but also for ordinary lay folk. People were going to confession quite a bit. Luther went to confession all the time as a monk because he was so terrified. Um, but the ex one of the things that could happen in the confessional um, is that you're exploring your own conscience, but that there's an inner exploration of your conscience to find all the sins. And you want to find every single mortal sin and confess it. Um, and, you know, if you miss a mortal sin, then you're, you, you, go to, you, you go to your, uh, you, 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 you die in a state of mortal sin. And this is uh, absolutely dreadful because it's hell. So introspection became a source of terror. And that's, I think, an, an important historical moment in the late Middle Ages. And the Reformation was in part a response to that introspective terror. When I look at my conscience, when I explore my conscience, I find all sorts of reasons to be worried that I'm going to go to hell and be tortured for eternity, which is a terrifying thing. So um, now, one of the things that Luther is doing by preaching the gospel in and, and, and the way he does is he's saying the gospel is a promise. It's God's own promise. It's backed up by nothing less than the truthfulness of God. So you can really depend on that. And if God has promised to be your savior, then the only thing you need to be assured of your salvation is just to believe that he's not lying to you. And that's how you get the Lutheran notion of, of justification by faith alone. All you need to do to, to hear this promise and believe it is to, you know, to receive it in faith. And that's how you're assured that you're not heading to hell as soon as you die because Jesus Christ promised and he keeps his word because he's God in the flesh and God never lies. So that is a certain kind of freedom and Luther loves to talk about the freedom of a Christian. It's a freedom that frees you to stop trying to justify yourself, uh, to stop worrying about whether you're good enough. No, you're not good enough, you're a sinner, right? You're never perfect enough in this life. Don't worry about that. Christ takes care of that part of, he, he promises himself to you. Meanwhile, what are you gonna do with your life once you have believed the gospel, right? You no longer have to worry about being good enough. What are you gonna do? You're gonna serve your neighbor with good works and with love. And that's how faith leads to love for Luther. 
and how faith leads to discipleship um, and how the alien righteousness, which is the true righteousness deep in our hearts, as I'm, I'm kind of par uh, paradoxical, but I, I wanted to insist on that last night. What Luther calls alien righteousness is alien in the Latin sense. It belongs to another. It's Christ's righteousness, but that becomes mine by faith alone. By faith, I simply receive Christ and all that is his, including his righteousness. So that alien righteousness is my deep new identity. I'm a new person because of that alien righteousness. I'm now a good tree that can actually do good, uh, good works. Not perfect, never perfect, never good enough to justify myself, but I can actually do good works because of this good fruit, this good tree that I've become, because I've become a good person because Christ is in my heart because the gospel, right? So by faith alone, I become this new person and then the good works follow. And the good works are not to justify myself. The good works are what Luther loves to call free. Right? You're doing this not, not to justify yourself, but just because your neighbor needs your good works. Uh, you know, God doesn't need your love and you don't even need your love to justify yourself, but your neighbor needs your love and your good works. So go to it, be like Christ, go ahead. That's what your calling is. And that's how faith leads to love and discipleship. Um, and that's also related to another question um, about the relationship of justification and justice. Uh, justification is about justice. Um, probably most of you know that, that there's a translation issue here. Um, the old English translation for the word that gets translated justice, justitia in Latin, or dikaiosune in Greek, or gerechtigkeit in German, the old way of translating that into English was righteousness but not justice, which would actually be, a, a, I think, a closer translation. So whenever you're reading Luther and whenever I'm talking about righteousness in this talk, remember that it's just another way of saying justice. And in German and Latin and Greek, there's only one word here, right? English happens to have two, righteousness and justice. Um, and that's actually a bit misleading because in English, those two words have drifted apart in meaning and righteousness starts to sound almost like self-righteousness. Um, and justice sounds like something different, but they're actually translating exactly the same word when, when you're translating German or when you're translating Latin or when you're translating Greek. So what about justice and justification? Um, Luther thinks there's, there's two kinds of, <laughs> in another setting, Luther will say there's two other kinds of righteousness. Uh, Luther loves pairing things. Um, in his later works, he'll talk about two kinds of righteousness. There's the righteousness of God, which is that alien righteousness, which transforms us and makes us new people in Christ when received by faith alone. And then there's what he calls civil righteousness um, or uh, you could say uh, political justice, right? Civil is just Latin for political. Civis is Latin for city, polis is Greek for, for city. So civic is political. Civic righteousness is civic justice, political justice. We could call it social justice. Um, he thinks that you know the civic righteousness is something that you don't have to be a Christian to have that. Right? Uh, pagans can be have civic righteousness. So people will think of Cicero uh, in, in Luther's day. Um, so pagans can have civic righteousness and pagans and Christians can work together in this political justice for the common good um, in earthly matters. Um, but Christians will have a special motivation to serve the work of political justice because their job is to serve their neighbor in love and one of the things you do in love is to set things right, to do justice. And biblical justice, of course, is fundamentally, I think, uh, setting things right. Um, and so that's one of the things that justification frees you for. It frees you so you don't have to worry about justifying yourself or being a good Christian or any of those other things. It's not about you, for heaven's sakes. Christ is about you and Christ is for you. And so believe that he's taken care of that and then serve your neighbor because you've got you've got work to do you've got lots of work to do christ is calling you to be like himself that's a lot of hard work it might even mean a cross but it also means doing justice so i think that's that's where that goes um that's that transformation um another question uh someone asked is this like this you know the already not yet kind of paradox that you get so much in the new testament and especially New Testament eschatology? And uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, this process of justification, remember that's my, my heresy as a Luther scholar, I think justification is a process. Um, it's a process of growing in Christ, becoming more and more like Christ. And that means that we're always on the road. 
uh, Luther will say in his lectures on Romans, um, we're always in motion, always in motion, which is to say, we're always on the road, we're not home yet, we're always halfway through the process or partway through the process, which means the process is imperfect. Um, it's real, it's changing, it's really changing us, but we're not there yet. Luther will use an example that's really comes from Aristotelian philosophy. Um, and I, I gave that example before. Imagine a half-built house. A half-built house is not yet a house. And yet it's a house that you're building. And you can point at it and say, there's the house I'm building. Of course, it's not yet a house. It's a house, but not yet a house. Likewise, you can talk and point to a Christian and say, there's a just person, not yet a just person, still a sinner, but, but a just person, right? Sinner and just person, sinner and righteous at the same time. So this, uh, it's famous um, among Lutherans, it's the simul, uh, simul uh, Latin for at the same time. The, the whole Latin phrase is simul justus et peccator. Uh, at the same time, a just person or righteous person and uh, a sinner. This is precisely, <laughs> some people read that simul as a denial that we make progress in righteousness. But in an Aristotelian context, which is the context of Luther's thought, it's a description of how things are whenever the process is going on. Um, so the, the, the way that Luther thinks about already and not yet is this Aristotelian way of doing it because Aristotle is the, the fundamental philosophy that everybody learns in school in Luther's day. And Luther has some famous disagreements with Aristotle, which we can talk about. But on this point, he explicitly agrees with Aristotle. Aristotle gets it right about how processes work. And the process of justification is one where we're always in motion, always heading forward to a righteousness that is not yet, uh, but always uh, pushing back away from um, uh, the, the sin that needs to be behind us and, uh, and, and you know, we're, we're leaving sin behind and we're heading toward righteousness. And that's, that's what faith does. And, and if you look for it, you'll see that language all the time in, in Luther. Faith begins and makes progress and is perfected in death. So there's um, it, emphatically Luther's in that uh, sort of already not yet tension, which he articulates using the Augustinian metaphor of journey and also the Aristotelian notion of process. Um, and that's, that's, it's absolutely fascinating to see that work out. And it's one of the neglected aspects of Luther's thought. Finally, last question, um, which was also, I think the first question that got asked, um, or one of the first, um, doesn't this look like something like a convergence with the Eastern church fathers? And to, pack, uh, to unpack that a bit, the answer is absolutely, yes. Um, the Eastern church fathers are famous for a doctrine of deification or theosis. Luther's earliest work is um, about deification. And I'll, we'll end up talking about that. A, a sermon on Christmas day in 1514, one of the few things we have uh, from Luther that early on in his career was taken down by in notes. Um, and it's a sermon on deification. It's a sermon on how um, God became human so that humans could become God. Um, and there's some qualifications about that. We don't become you know, the uncreated eternal God, but we, do, we are deified. And uh, that really becomes, I think, the basis for all that, Chris, uh, all that Luther ends up saying about uh, uh, how faith saves us. But we'll get to that at the end of all the lectures, I hope. Um, this will be tied to the notion of, of being formed in the image of Christ, which is the, the theme of the, the last lecture. Um, we're formed in the image of Christ, and that's a process. That's what happens when we have faith, because by faith we're united with Christ, and Christ dwells within our hearts by faith, and that forms us. And that's a, a process that that is going on throughout our lives. And and I'll try to articulate that as as a way of thinking about um, our situation today. Okay, there are some questions um, that with some brief answers, and I hope that sets things up for us um, for the talk today. We are now at nine fifty one. Uh, Nick, I have until like, what, uh, 10.30? Is that right? Uh, the Q&A can, can stretch until uh, 10.35. 10.35. Okay. And I have 9.50 on my clock. Okay, good. Well, let's, uh, let's roar through this. We've got some, some good stuff coming up. So um, what I wanted to talk about 
um, the overarching theme is, is, is the gospel, how the gospel saves us, which is, of course is a key Protestant theme. It saves us by giving us grace. It gives us grace by giving us Christ. It has the structure of a sacrament because it's an external sign that gives us what it signifies because words are signs just like sacraments are signs. So that's what I wanna articulate and also think about how Luther got there. To, to talk about how Luther got there, I'd like to start um, with the notion of penance again and how Luther worked out the notion of penance in some of his early writings before he'd really clarified his thinking about the gospel. So, so think of this as penance without the gospel, which I think is, is where Luther is in 1515, 1516, um, all the way up until uh, 15, uh, 1517 really with the, the 95 Theses. Um, in the 95 Theses uh, in 1517, he's uh, thinking about the indulgences and, and I'm not gonna have time to say a lot about how that works but I'm sure most of you know about how indulgences were sold in the 16th century. His objection to ind indulgences, it turns out in 15, 17, is that they're likely to create complacency, right? Um, he's also objecting to how they're being sold and how German money is going across the Alps into Italy. Um, because of course, penance was part of a whole economy um, and a whole lot of people were paying a lot of money to hopefully get themselves out of purgatory. And maybe they were even kind of confused about this because the theologians were being confusing about this. Maybe you could even pay some money and get out of hell. Um, uh, nobody actually taught that, but I bet you a lot of folks were telling the laity that as a way of getting, uh, extracting money from them. And, and everybody kind of knew that this was going on. Um, although nobody quite knew how much money, and Luther himself didn't know that the money for, from indulgences being sold in his neighborhood was, was, <laughs> was going to the Pope, um, as well as to the, the, the big archbishop in the neighborhood, uh, Albert of Mainz. But as a pastor, Luther's main concern was not just the economics. It was that indulgences might create a certain kind of complacency. I pay the money and I'm okay, right? Um, my spiritual life is just fine. I've, I've paid up, right? And, and as soon as the money goes into the chest, then um, I can you know, release somebody like my grandmother from purgatory. Um, Luther's thinking that doesn't make sense. We need real penance. And Luther at, in 1517 is a monk who's really dedicated to real penance. And real penance, it turns out for Luther in 1517, means self-hatred. He actually tells us this in uh, the, the uh, 95 Theses, Thesis number four. Hatred of self is the true inner repentance. Well, in his lectures of the previous two years, mainly on the letter to the Romans, Luther has been talking about self-hatred as the, the means of justification. Self-hatred is what penance is. Penance is what drives justification for the early Luther. This again is penance without gospel. Indeed, it's very much like what Luther will later call law without gospel. Um, self-hatred is, is your attempt to justify yourself by hating yourself. Uh, let me read... Um, an astonishing passage a uh, couple years before the 95 Theses um, from this uh, lecture, lecture series on Romans, because you know Luther's day job was to be a, a, a biblical scholar, a, um, a Bible professor at, at the university. So here's how he writes about this uh, uh, in his lectures on Romans. He, he, yeah, we actually have his, his uh, lecture notes. Well, he says this, we need to flee good things and take on evil things. Not by words alone or in pretense, but in full feeling of heart, we must confess, and he's thinking now of, of penance, and wish ourselves to be destroyed and damned. And he's serious about this. The way you justify yourself for the early Luther is to desire to be damned forever. We need to act toward ourselves, says Luther, like someone who hates someone else. He doesn't just pretend to hate him, but seriously desires to destroy and kill and damn the person he hates. So if we also, in a true and heartfelt way, 
destroy and persecute ourselves and offer ourselves to hell for God's sake and his righteousness, then we have truly made satisfaction to his justice and he will have mercy and deliver us. It's an astonishing passage. Um, if we hate ourselves truly and sincerely enough, God will justify us. Because at that point, you know, he has nothing more to accuse us of. We've done all the accusing. It's a kind of attempt to, to uh, run ahead of God's hatred of sin by hating ourselves and accusing ourselves enough. And that's what Luther was teaching these monks in, um, in his lectures. It was at the um, University of Wittenberg, mostly monks and, and priests in training, getting his lectures in Latin. And that's what he thought that, you know, indulgences was short circuiting that process of self-hatred. And you might get a lot of ordinary people, you know, lay people might end up being damned because they're not hating themselves enough. That's where Luther is when he's writing the 95 Theses. Um, he's thinking of the word of God as fundamentally an accusation. He actually has a passage um, interpreting um, the, the, that, the thing that Jesus says about um, uh, agreeing with your accuser. Right? When you are going to the, to the altar, agree with your accuser on the way. Uh, Luther interprets that as meaning agree with God when he accuses you. The word of God is accusing you all the time. It's telling you what a sinner you are. Um, this is, again is what Luther later calls law rather than gospel. Um, but at this point in 1515, 1516, for Luther, the, the word of God is fundamentally law. It's fundamentally accusation. Well, what would happen if you had a different kind of word, a word that wasn't accusation? a word that was mercy and forgiveness and grace and absolution. Well, of course, he'd been hearing that word for years and evidently not paying much attention because the sacrament of penance, of course, is not just confession. At the end of the, 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 the penitential confession, you should be hearing the word of absolution, the word from the priest saying, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Luther had been hearing that word for years going to the sacrament of penance, but he doesn't seem to have given it any thought. Luther, uh, prior to the indulgence controversy that was set up by the 95 Theses, does not seem to have given any thought to the sacraments. Um, you, he doesn't have a, a treatment of the sacraments. He doesn't have a discussion of any of the sacraments, including the sacrament of penance. But when he starts, when, when the indulgence controversy gets going in 1518, he's going to have to think about the sacrament of penance because indulgences are attached to the sacrament of penance. And so Luther, for the first time in his career, I think, starts to seriously think about sacraments. And of course, sacraments are not accusations. Sacraments are means of grace. So Luther has to think seriously about words of grace, I think, really for the first time in his career after the 95 Theses in, in light of um, the um, indulgence controversy. By the time he gets to 1519, he is writing about the sacraments a lot. Um, there's a wonderful trio of sermons on three sacraments, which I wanna draw from uh, in the next section of this talk. He writes, a, well, he, he preaches three sermons and then he writes them up and one of them is on baptism, one of them is on the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, and one of them is on the sacrament of penance. The one on the sacrament of penance draws on a set of disputation theses that have been identified by people like Oswald Bayer as the first time that Luther thinks of the gospel as a promise. So that's a very different kind of word from an accusation. You know, think of it as a difference in genre. Luther had been thinking that the genre of the word of God is accusation and condemnation. But here's a word of God that is promise and uh, comfort and kindness. And it starts, I think, really from hearing the word of absolution in the sacrament of penance. So I'd like to turn now to that little sermon in 1519 uh, now I will share this with you. Let me do this properly. Um, I'm going to share screen. I'm going to go to the Luther Sacrament of Penance. And do we have it there? There we are. Is that right? Um, are, can you all see that? 
Good. Okay. Now, this is again for for those of you who are not Lutherans. It's in these red volumes that every Lutheran knows of the um, um, works of Luther. Uh, this is volume thirty-five, and we're now at page eleven. And I should be able to ah, let me get this right. Um, let me show you. Here we go. Good. All right. It starts uh, here. LW 35, Luther's Works, volume 35, the Sacrament of Penance, 1519, uh, starting on page nine. But we're gonna skip over to page 11. And here we have uh, paragraph six. Now there are three things in the Holy Sacrament of Penance. This is how he actually um, articulates all three of these sacraments that he writes about um, in 1519. The sign, and then there's the, the meaning or the significance of the sign, the thing it signifies, and then there's faith. So three things, sign, significance, faith. In the sacrament of penance, um, the thing signified is absolution. So, uh, so this is where what it's all about. The first is absolution, he says there in section six, uh, three things. The first is absolution. These are the words of the priest which show, tell and proclaim to you that you are free and that your sins are forgiven. Um, based on the above quoted words of Christ to St. Peter. I'm gonna get back to that in a second. And again, the absolution has this form, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those of you who are Catholic will know this quite well. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I just misled you. The absolution is not the thing signified. The absolution is the sign. That's actually an important point and my mistake. The absolution is an external word and words are signs. So the absolution, I mean, I can say, I can give you the sign right now. I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, since this is not sacramental penance, that's not the word of God, and it doesn't really do anything, but it's the same words as the words of absolution, because the words of absolution are mere external words, and yet they're words of salvation. That's how it works for the sacrament, right? I could also say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I haven't baptized anybody, but there's the same words, right? Mere external words, and yet they're going to do everything. Okay, that's first thing. The absolution is the sign. A little further down, the second point. The second is grace. That's the thing signified. Uh, every sacrament really signifies some form of grace. The second is grace, the forgiveness of sins, the peace and comfort of the conscience, as opposed to the terror of conscience that Luther had way back when he was afraid of dying in a thunderstorm. Uh, and still to this day, he, I mean, in 15, 19, Luther is often terrified of his sins. But if you believe the word of absolution, then you, you can't be terrified of your sins anymore. You have to actually be comforted because God is telling you that he's uh, absolving you of your sins. Uh, that's why it's called the sacrament, he says. Uh, in the next line, a holy sign, because in it one hears the words externally. That's the external word that signify spiritual gifts within. That's the gift of grace that's, that's signified. Gifts by which the heart is comforted and set at peace. So that's the sign and the thing signified. Now the third element, sign, thing sig signified, and then faith. It's faith that brings sign and thing signified together. The third is faith, which firmly believes that the absolution and the words of the priest are true by the power of Christ's words, Whatever you loose in heaven shall be loosed. On, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's the, the, the passage of the keys in Matthew 16. Uh, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But first, one more thing about faith. Notice the structure of faith here. Faith hears the external sign, the absolution, and believes that it's true because it's God's truth and therefore receives what it signifies. It's because of faith that sign and thing signified come together. Uh, when I say right now, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm not baptizing anybody, and you don't believe it, and there's no baptism, right? But I've said the words, right? The words have to be said in the right sacramental context, and they have to be received in faith, and without the faith, nothing happens, right? So thus he says um, in the next paragraph, everything then depends on this faith, which alone makes the sacraments accomplish what they signify, and everything that the priest says come true. So he'll emphasize faith alone at this point. And this is where the doctrine of the faith, uh, faith alone ends up coming from. Um, but Luther will also later emphasize the external sign in a way that is not quite present in this text, because in this text, he wants to, to emphasize, you know, well, I'll, I'll, 
He, in this text, he's emphasizing the faith alone. Later on, he has Protestant critics who are much more inward turning than Luther. And against them, he will emphasize the external word because faith bringing together the sign and the thing signified can't accomplish anything without the sign. Without the word of absolution, there's nothing to believe in. Without the promise of the gospel, there's nothing to believe in. So the external word does have to come first. And in later works, Luther will emphasize the power of the external word. Here he emphasizes the power of faith. They go together, faith and promise go together. Um, and Luther will constantly connect them. Faith can accomplish nothing without the promise, but the promise doesn't accomplish anything without faith. All right, so let's think what is accomplished by faith here. And for that, we need to go up to the biblical basis of the sacrament of penance. And that's Matthew 16, 18, uh, or 16, 19. It's the promise of the keys given to St. Peter, right? Uh, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Um, uh, famous passage that popes all love. And uh, Luther's gonna have to talk about that. But what's the point of the passage? It's the gift of the keys which unlock our sins and unlock the mercy of God. And the, the promise is this. And this is again, the promise of Christ in the gospel, in scripture. Uh, and, and the second line, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And um, in the Latin translation of these things, um, loose is um, absolve, right? Um, absolve is, is um, related to this word loose, solvere in Latin. So it, it's really saying whatever you absolve on earth shall be absolved in heaven. That authorizes the sacrament of penance. It authorizes the priest or the confessor to absolve sins in the name of Christ and by the power of Christ and on the basis of the promise of Christ. What Luther's gonna do at this point is he's gonna take the sacrament of penance further than any Catholic or Roman Catholic ever wants to take it, right? He's actually gonna push the sacramental power of this further than, than um, Catholics at the time. And well, the question is whether Catholics today wanna to go quite this far because Luther's gonna go very far with this. It's the promise of God. It's the promise of Christ. Therefore, you can absolutely rely on it. And it sets up what is really fundamentally a kind of double structure of the word of God that I think is fundamental for Luther's sacramental thinking. The double structure I mean is first, the promise of Christ in the gospel. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you absolve on earth shall be absolved in heaven. That's the gospel promise within the gospel itself. It's the promise of Christ. It's the word of God. But then there's another word of God and that's the absolution itself. Luther is convinced, and he teaches in this text, and I'll show you where, Luther's convinced that when you hear the priest or the pastor, and very soon it doesn't have to be an ordained priest, if you hear the priest and the pastor absolve you of your sins in Christ's name, and you're a baptized Christian, you hear that word of absolution, you should receive it as the word of Christ himself. That's the promise of God directed to you in person, not just people in general, right? The, 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 the pastor or the priest says, I absolve you, and that means you, and you have no right not to believe it. Luther will actually insist on this, right? The, the worst thing you could do is, is not to believe this and to say, oh, well, I'm not really worthy of the absolution. I haven't had enough contrition. I'm not sincere enough. That will get you damned, Luther thinks, right? Because Christ is promising. And what right do you have to call Christ a liar? Don't you dare call Christ a liar. You must believe that he loves you and cares for you and absolves you of your sins, you have no right not to be comforted. Right? There's a, a kind of must in service of a may, to use Karl Barth's language about this. Um, you must believe this word is true because it's Christ's promise, and therefore you may believe that you are loved by God, your sins are forgiven, you may be comforted and have peace of conscience because you don't have a, you don't have a choice. If Christ says your sins are forgiven, then your sins are forgiven. Let's look at how that goes. I'm gonna skip down a couple of pages. Um, ah, good, let's see, this is section 15, right? Um, go down to, to section 15 here on the left-hand side of the page. It follows, says Luther, that the keys or the authority of St. Peter, that's um, going back to Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. 
The authority of St. Peter is not an authority at all, he says, but a service. Um, in German, it's not a Gewalt, but a Dienst. And the, it's the Dienst that, that he'll later call ministry. And the keys have not been given to St. Peter, but to you and me, um, or rather it's given to St. Peter for our sake. For the keys are yours and mine, says Luther. Uh, elsewhere in this text, he says, look, um, it should be a priest, but you know, if, if it can really be any Christian who gives you this absolution, and if it could be a woman or a child who gives you this absolution, he actually says that. Um, you can see that this is heading toward the, the Lutheran doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. Um, and and this, becomes a, this does become an issue about ministry and about the constitution of the church, right? Luther really doesn't think you have to be an ordained minister to, to give this word of absolution. It should properly be ordained ministers, but not necessary. Uh, and, and that will be a, that's why some, some of the deepest ecumenical differences are about ministry and ecclesiology. But let's keep on thinking about the, the, the use and the meaning of the keys. And here, I think there's great agreement. Um, third line there, or fourth line, for St. Peter, insofar as he is a pope or a bishop, he doesn't need them. To him, they're neither necessary nor helpful. Their entire virtue, it's virtue in the old sense of power, their entire virtue or power lies rather in this, that they help sinners, right? not popes and bishops, but sinners by comforting and strengthening their conscience at the top of the page. Thus Christ ordered that the exercise of authority in the church be, should be a rendering of service. And this is why of course, Protestant pastors end up being called ministers, servants, ministers of the word. And that means by means, um, and that by means of the keys of the clergy, I'm part, pardon me, let me try that again. By means of the keys, the clergy should be serving not themselves, but only us. Okay, that's actually not so, so hard to agree with, right? The point of the gift of forgiveness is not to serve the, 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 the minister, it's to serve the people of God. I think in the background here now, Luther is thinking about how um, bishops and popes and um, some priests are making a lot of money out of penance. Uh, and, and, and indulgences and such. Um, although, by the way, low-level clergy didn't make a lot of money, but, but archbishops and popes are a different story. So they shouldn't be serving themselves, but us. Next sentence, for this reason, as one sees, the priest does no more than to speak a word, and the sacrament's already there. The word comes and it's a sacrament, says Augustine. He's, um, Luther is mimicking Augustine on that point. And then here comes the, the, the crucial quote, and this word, is God's word, even as God has promised. That's what I'm calling the double structure of God's word in Luther. This word is God's word. That's the absolution. You hear it with your ears and it says you, and it means you in particular. I absolve you, you in particular, right? This is not just a general promise for everybody. This is about you in particular that God is promising. But so this word is God's word. That's the absolution. Even as God has promised, that's the promise of the keys in the gospel. This is, I think, absolutely crucial to understand. I still remember um, a philosopher of religion quoting, I think it was Jonathan Edwards. He said, you know, your name is not in the Bible. Right? The Bible doesn't talk to you directly. Um, well, maybe, um, but in the sacrament, in the sacrament, God says you, and he means me. When I was baptized, right, similar thing. The word of baptism, which of course is the model for the word of absolution. The word of baptism was said to me by Christ through the mouth of a pastor. And that word was directed to me and it meant me, me in, in particular. And I was even named in my baptism. And that was the word of God. And so for Luther, whenever you're in, in anxiety about, um, about your sins, remember that Christ called you by name and he baptized you and he claimed you as his own. And you don't have a right to call him a liar. So you don't have a right to believe you're damned. And you don't have a right to believe that God is gonna hold your sins against you. Right? You only have a right to believe that he loves you and forgives you and is going to redeem you. You can see where this is going, I think. And, and why the word of the gospel has such incredible power in Luther's thought, because behind it is the truth of God. Right? If you don't believe this word, you're calling God a liar, and you have no right to do this. Um, so that's, um, that's crucial, and it, it means that you also have something external to cling to. Uh, 
think of that, that sense of helplessness when Luther was out in the thunderstorm, St. Anne, help me, I'll become a monk, because he doesn't have anything to help him. The mature Luther would end up saying, just trust that Christ is your savior, like he promised. Right? Stop doubting that Christ will save you. He promised, and he's, he will keep his word. Right? So you may die the next moment, but remember, you have a savior. He promised. That's the truth. And just believe the truth about Christ in the gospel. Right? So there's no promise that you won't die in a thunderstorm, but there is a promise that when you die, you have a savior because he's promised himself to you in, his, in your baptism and every time you receive absolution. And of course, also in a different way in the Eucharist. Um, one qualification about this um, that'll probably be familiar. Um, uh, Luther eventually says that there's not a separate sacrament of penance. There's only the two, um, baptism and Eucharist. But it's actually quite ambiguous because he ends up saying that um, penance is still a sacrament. And Luther says this explicitly. Penance is still a sacrament. It's just not a different sacrament from baptism. So penance is really a way of renewing and returning to your baptism. Uh, as the words themselves suggest, right? I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is a, is a recurrence of this promise, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So penance is just baptism renewed and, and confirmed. Um, so, and this is why um, Philip Melanchthon will call the word of absolution the very voice of the gospel, and he will regard it also as sacramental. So it's not just Luther. Um, this double structure of God's word, does seem to be the first time that Luther really thinks about the gospel as a promise. And that becomes, I think, enormously important because it's the core of this new notion of the gospel, the gospel that saves us, right? A word of God that doesn't simply accuse us, doesn't simply make us penitent, it makes us righteous, it makes us just because it gives us Christ. So let's in fact turn again to a different text. I'm going to turn that off and now go to uh, a different text. Um, and that is, oh no, don't tell me that I turned that one off. Um, let me go here, ha ha, let's see, do we have it here? Yes, there we go. Uh, are you seeing um, Luther on the gospel? No, probably not. Um, why am I not able to find this? I'm now annoyed at my, um, up, 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 up. Ah. I don't know why I'm not finding this. Um, all right, let's see, um, what? Oh, you re may recall what I call the Lutheran codicil, the promises give what the commandments require. And I'm going to try to find that one more time. Um, I'm not sure why it's not here. Let me try this again, um, because it should be there. Luther on the gospel. All right, I'm gonna share this, that screen. There we are, okay, good, pardon me. Okay, so this is uh, the freedom of a Christian, probably the greatest text that Luther writes, certainly one of the most beautiful. Remember last time, uh, he divides the scripture of God into two parts commandments and promises. That's basically law and gospel. And then he says over here on the other side of the page, thus the promises of God give what the commandments of God demand. Right? How do you become righteous? How do you become a good Christian? How do you please God? Simply by believing that God's promises are true. That's the first great power of, of the word of God or the first great power of faith. Um, power of faith, power of word of God, really the same thing. That's the first power of faith. Then the second power in the next page, there's a further function of faith that it honors him who it trusts with the most reverent and highest regard since it considers him truthful and trustworthy. That's always the intermediate step, right? Faith means believing that God keeps his word and that God is truthful. Let God be true and every man a liar. Even if I'm a hypocrite, even if I'm insincere, even if I'm a liar when I come to God, right? God's promise remains true and I can trust in it. So I don't have to say, oh, am I really truly giving my heart to Christ? Right? That's a later Protestant problem. And the answer to that question, am I really truly giving my heart to Christ is no. I have never given my heart to Christ adequately. I have no hope at all unless Christ keeps his promises. That's kind of the Lutheran answer to this. And that's why there's a certain kind of tension within Protestantism about those issues. Um, 
And that's why I wrote that book on good news for anxious Christians. Isn't it nice to be able to trust Christ instead of yourself, right? So, um, all right, um, that's a rabbit trail that I won't go down into unless we wanna talk about um, Lutherans and evangelicals and such. All right, page 351. Okay, and I'll, we're running short of time. I'll try to finish this up. The third incomparable benefit of faith is that it unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with his bridegroom. And I realized that's what we're gonna to have to talk about next time. It's union with Christ as the fundamental thing that happens um, through faith alone. But there's another step now that I need to give you, if I can give you one more sheen, uh, screen share, um, and that's going to be, um, ha ha, I need to give you the gospel as a sacrament. Um, the gospel, Luther himself calls the gospel a sacrament, um, and he does it in a, another Christmas sermon. Some of his best sermons are on Christmas. Um, I'm going to give you this. Oh, no, 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 that's not what you want. Let me give you... Um, I thought I had this set up and I have not got it set up yet, but it'll be there in just a second. Um, Christmas, uh, Christmas in 1519. Um, do I have it here? No, that's not what I want. Uh, all right, I think I'm gonna give that to you next. Um, right, so here's what we'll do. Uh, let's, let's do questions and answer for 10 minutes and I will set up this um, document about in 1519, where Luther basically says um, that the gospel is a sacrament. The gospel words are a sacrament uh, because it, it's, it gives what it signifies to those who believe. Um, but unfortunately, I've made the, the terrible mistake of forgetting to set that up um, beforehand because I had too many things to set up. Um, is there anything else to tell you about this? One more thing. Um, no, I'll save that for next. So. Here's what we're gonna do um, when, we, when we resume. I will show you two Christmas sermons of Luther's in 1519 and then 1514. Both of them will focus, um, well, one will focus on the gospel as a sacrament. The other will focus on uh, union with Christ and deification. And we'll also talk about how um, uh, in the freedom of Christian, how faith is, has this power of uniting us with Christ. That's going to be the heart of um, this notion of being formed in Christ, which I think is what we want to learn from Luther today. But meanwhile, let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and deal with any questions people have. We have about ten minutes, right? Yes, Dr. Carey, uh, Kenneth Tanner uh, mentioned um, during your talk. Uh, he says it would seem that the sign is objective and is true regardless of the quality of reception, but the full subjective benefits and time come to those who believe. And, and if I can tack on to that more of a question, uh, doesn't, it, doesn't it seem that Luther in his later writings as he's dealing with the Eucharist really stress the objectivity of the, um, the grace coming through the sacrament, the, the you know, uh, is means is uh, in terms of the body and blood of Christ and the Eucharist um, right. as, as opposed to, uh, you know, what will later get developed, say, in the Reformed tradition of the receptionist view that you have to believe. Uh, it. Yeah. Okay, right. So here we are um, talking about the Eucharist. That, that's almost inevitable, right? Um, here's an interesting thought experiment to begin with. Imagine trying to articulate this point without using the words objective and subjective, which were invented in their current usage by Immanuel Kant about 200 years later. Um, and so one of the things I do when I, when I read medieval and early Reformation thinkers is try to avoid that language because the objective subjective distinction does a bunch of funny things like Kant shows or tries to argue and remember, he, he invented the word objective, basically. Kant argues that all objectivity is really a form of subjectivity. All objectivity is really transcendental subjectivity. Or we could say scientific objectivity is methodological subjectivity, using the right method. So all objectivity resolves to subjectivity. What we need is something other than this notion of objectivity. What we need is a word that's been all the way back to the Old Testament. And the word that we need 
according to Luther, is truth. So if we think about truth, we'll, we'll get this right, I think. Um, is the word true even when I don't believe it? And you can imagine Luther's answer, a robust yes. And he says quite clearly, the word of absolution is true even if you don't believe it. It's like um, if someone bequeaths something to you in a will and bestows upon you, actually Luther's example is uh, a king gives you a castle. Imagine he, he, he dies and, he, and in his will, he, he gives you a castle. Um, and you say, oh, I don't believe it. And so you never receive the castle. Or your, your parents deposit a, a whole bunch, a treasure in your bank account, but you don't believe it. It's there, it's in your name, and it does you no good. Um, the treasure is right there on the table, says Luther, but you're going to have to pick it up and use it. Uh, and if you don't, it doesn't do you any good. So the word is true, and the gift is actually given, but you refuse to receive it. It's like someone puts something in your, in your hands and you drop it on the floor, right? You could actually imagine that being done in the Eucharist, right? Um, so that's one thing. Luther is absolutely emphatic that the, the external word is true because it's God's word, and God keeps his word, whether we receive it or not. Um, it, it just doesn't do us any good. So um, part of the language here is the language of, of efficacy versus the language of validity. The sacrament is valid and therefore true, whether we re receive its grace or not. Ah, because here's the crucial connection. It's faith that brings together sign and things signified. You can receive a valid sacramental sign without faith. People do it all the time. You can be baptized without faith. You can receive the Eucharist without faith. And you receive the valid sacramental sign, but you don't receive what it signifies, right? Because faith is what makes the, the sacrament efficacious as well as valid. Now, with the Eucharist, here's the tricky part that I think gets overlooked over and over and over again, and it, it solves a whole lot of problems. The Calvinist tradition came to assume that the body and blood of Christ were the things signified in the Eucharist. But the medieval tradition was more complicated than that. The medieval tradition, which includes Luther on this point, identified the body and blood of Christ as both sign and thing signified. Um, the medieval language is sacramentum et res, sacrament and thing. That is sacrament and thing signified, sign and thing signified. So the body of Christ is not just what is signified in the sacrament, it's also what is what the sign itself. Luther will say, um, in order to reassure us of his love for us, God gave us Christ's body as a sign, not just things signified. And remember, a valid sacrament is a valid sacramental sign. So every valid sacrament has a valid sign. What's the valid sign in the sacrament of the, of the Eucharist? The body and blood of Christ, as well as bread and wine. Uh, uh, Luther thinks, you know, the bread and wine is still there. He doesn't believe in transubstantiation. Uh, by the way, he doesn't think transubstantiation is a monstrous teaching either, the way many Protestants do. You know, you, you, if you want to get rid of the bread and the wine, fine, right? So long as the body and blood of Christ are there, right? But you don't need that extra miracle, says Luther. Um, but what you do need is the body and blood of Christ. And it matters to Luther immensely that the body and blood of Christ are there. It's right there in your mouth. Why? Because God promised. And that word is always a word that God keeps. So the, the body and blood of Christ are the sign, and therefore it's always present in the sacrament because a sacrament is a sign and it's not a valid sacrament without that sign. And that's, that's I think, how it all works. Once John Calvin comes along and he identifies the body and blood of Christ as the thing signified. And then he makes the point that Luther and Augustine and the whole tradition agree with. If you receive the sign of the sacrament without faith, you don't receive the thing the sacrament signifies. And that's why you, that's why you have in Anglican tradition, you have receptionism it's called, which basically says, if you don't receive the sacrament in faith, you don't receive the body and blood of Christ. But, but if the body and blood of Christ is the sign, then it's there whether you uh, receive it in faith or not. And that's the crucial difference, I think. There, there are two other questions that have come in. Uh, you only have a, a few minutes, so I'll go ahead and uh, read them both and see which one you, you want to take on. Uh, the first one is about the faults, the failures, even the sins of, of folks like Augustine and Luther, and uh, how do we take them seriously given what we know about them? The second is uh, regarding fruit, good works produced in and through uh, the Christian by means of the Holy Spirit. Does Luther believe these can be observed by the Christian? 
Uh -huh. Observing them ensure that they're not originating from the spirit, but from the self. Okay, let's let's postpone the issue about the sins of our Christian teachers, Augustine and Luther and such, until the end. Um, but that's something especially Lutherans have to deal with because when Luther goes wrong, Luther goes really wrong, especially when he writes about the Jews. So let's let's postpone that one. What about those fruits? And can you see them? Right. Um, Let's think about anxiety again and terror, right? Uh, you're a 16th century person. You're worried that, that God is your enemy because you're a sinner. And you're, you're a Christian, you're a baptized Christian, but you're insincere sometimes. You notice that about yourself, right? Um, as all Christians do, all of us Christian believers are also unbelievers. So what do you think of it? And, and then you, you also notice that your good works aren't as good as they ought to be. Um, here's the problem. Um, John Calvin comes along. And he wants to do something that I think is really quite new in the tradition. He wants to, to teach people that they are already saved. Uh, now, Augustine very clearly says, we're not yet saved. We're saved in hope, but not yet in reality. Luther picks up that language. Luther thinks we're not saved yet, right? But Calvin thinks we are, because we can know that we will persevere in faith to the end. And there's, thus we can know, how can we know this? We can know that we're elect. We can know that we're predestined. Right? That's why Calvinists like the doctrine of predestination. You can know that you're one of the people who is predestined to be saved. How can you know that? Well, you have to know that you have true saving faith. And true saving faith is a different kind of faith than temporary faith. And a, a Calvin will talk about temporary faith. It might, may seem just like real Christian faith, but it's not really real Christian faith. And temporary faith is not going to save you because you have to persevere in faith to the end. So um, what do you do? I mean, how do you know that you have true saving faith? There's really two options about that. Either you, uh, you believe that you have a, a genuine conversion experience and thus conversion becomes the, the real basis of the Christian life rather than baptism, or you look at the fruits of sanctification and say, oh, I'm making real progress. I, I'm, I'm acting uh, in genuine faith based on uh, faith in the gospel and I'm, uh, I have love for my neighbor. I'm really making progress and being sanctified. And that becomes a basis of what Calvinists call assurance of salvation. Um, but, but it also becomes the basis of a new kind of anxiety. Am I really being a good Christian? So most Protestants, of course, never worry about a mortal sin. They've never even heard of it, but they worry about whether they're really Christians, right? You look at your, your good works and you say, ah, are those really the works of a Christian? And, right? Luther, on the contrary, uh, doesn't go there. For Luther, if you're worried about whether you're really a Christian, then stop calling Christ a liar because he baptized you, right? You're a Christian. Christ baptized you, remember that, right? Um, and so here's, I'll, I'll conclude with this thought. If you ask most Protestants, are you saved? They'll say, sure, I accepted Christ into my life. If you ask Luther, are you saved? Are you born again? He'll say, sure, I'm baptized. That ends up being a very, two very different ways of dealing with anxiety. Um, and um, you know, one is more sacramental than the other. And I'll go with the sacramental one myself. Well, we can talk about that more next time.